Tonight, we'll be uh, looking at American history in a way that some of you may never have heard it told before. And we're going to start with one of the most tragic events in American history, Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor, December the 7th, 1941. About 2,000 Americans dead, 18 ships, including eight battleships, sunk or heavily damaged. About 200 planes destroyed on the ground, many more damaged. Very tragic day for America. Now, here's a question for you. What question do you think Americans were asking the day after Pearl Harbor, besides what's going to happen next? What question do you think Americans were asking the next day? And, yeah, how could such a, a tragedy have befallen us? How were we caught off guard? Well, President Roosevelt appointed a commission to answer that question. It's called the Roberts Commission. And uh, the Roberts Commission could be called very Washington-friendly. Uh, uh, Supreme Court Justice Owen Roberts, who headed it, was very close to Roosevelt. And um, retired Admiral Joseph Rees had been given a job in Lend-Lease by Roosevelt. The two Army generals uh, on the commission, one was on the personal staff of General George Marshall, the Army Chief of Staff, was chosen as a recommendation. The other was his close personal friend. Well, the commission conducted 19 days of hearings, uh, three in Washington and 16 in Hawaii. And at the conclusion, they issued an official report in which they said that Washington, prior to Pearl Harbor, had discharged its duties in an exemplary manner. They said all the blame for Pearl Harbor lay with our two commanders there, namely Admiral Husband Kimmel, the, who's on the left, of course, the uh, Pacific Fleet Commander in Hawaii, and General Walter C. Short, the Army Commander there. They said these men were guilty of dereliction of duty. They had failed to take adequate surveillance measures of the waters surrounding Hawaii. And in the headlines across America, the uh, words dereliction of duty appeared, and uh, these two were inundated with hate mail and death threats. Congressmen stood up and said they should be shot. They were responsible for the deaths of 2,000 Americans. Well, Kimmel and Short protested the findings of the Roberts Commission. They pointed out there were a number of irregularities. Uh, Justice Roberts had taken unsworn testimony for a good portion of the hearings. He had refused them the right to have fellow officers serve as their attorneys. They were not allowed the right to ask witnesses questions, and they also found that significant testimony was left out of the commission's report. So Kimmel and Short did something that's very unusual for an officer to ask for. They requested that they be court-martialed. But President Roosevelt refused. He said, no, no court-martials for these men. I've already relieved them of their duties. We're at war now. What good could come of a court-martial? But Kimmel and Short kept pressing their case, and Congress did too. They also wanted court-martials. And finally, in 1944, Congress mandated that the hearings take place. Members of Congress said, hey, we're obviously winning the war now. What's the big deal about letting these two guys have their day in court? So in 1944, the Naval Court of Inquiry and the Army Pearl Harbor Board convened. Now at these two proceedings, the attorneys for Kimmel and Short presented undeniable evidence that Washington had complete foreknowledge of the attack, but denied that information to the two commanders. As the admirals on the Naval Court of Inquiry heard that evidence being read, they threw their pencils on the ground in disgust. Admiral Kimmel was completely exonerated by the court, and all blame was placed on Washington. Um, now, of course, President Roosevelt was outside their official jurisdiction. He couldn't be named, but everybody knew who was being implicated. The Army Pearl Harbor Board also reached the same conclusion, that Washington had full foreknowledge of the attack, and here are their closing words in their official report. Up to the morning of December the 7th, 1941, Everything that the Japanese were planning to do was known to the United States. You can see that report online these days. Now, a uh, question to ask is, uh, the public reacted with uh, hate mail and death threats to the charge of dereliction of duty. How do you think the public responded to their exoneration of these two officers to the, uh, to the news that Washington had known about the attack? And the answer is, the public didn't respond because the public didn't know. President Roosevelt ordered that the results be quashed and held top secret in the interest of securing the war effort. However, after World War II, a number of forthright authors attempted to bring the truth to the public's attention. For example, in the 1950s, this book came out, The Final Secret of Pearl Harbor, subtitled The Washington Contribution by Rear Admiral Robert Theobald, who was in Pearl Harbor on the day of the attack commanding destroyers. There are several books like this. You know what? They didn't get media attention. They didn't get reviews in Time Magazine or the New York Times and were generally ignored. So most people didn't know these books were even out there. But a real breakthrough came in 1982 when John Tolan, the dean of World War II historians, Pulitzer Prize winner, undisputed historian, published this book called Infamy, 
Pearl Harbor and its aftermath, because at this point, a great many witnesses had come forward who had not come forward at the time of the court-martial. Now, following the publication of Tolan's book, I was asked to do a cover story. This is back in uh, 1986 for the New American on Pearl Harbor, summarizing what Toland and other writers had said. And then in 1989, the BBC produced this documentary, Sacrifice at Pearl Harbor, which you can buy online. Um, and the BBC's documentary repeated everything we'd said in the New American, and that's now been aired on the History Channel. Now, uh, at this point, you might be wondering, uh, wait a minute, Mr. Perloff, uh, you're saying that Washington knew about the attack. Now, isn't that just sensationalism? What is the evidence for that? Well, Washington knew about the attack from several sources. One was the Purple Code, which is the name given to the code that Japan used to communicate with its embassies and major consulates around the world. It's a very complicated code. So complicated it had to be enciphered and deciphered by machine. The Japanese were convinced no one could break it. But in 1940, a talented group of American cryptoanalysts did break that code. So in 1941, when our relations with Japan were tense, we were reading Japan's messages on a same-day basis. Every message was translated within 24 hours. And every day, those messages went to President Roosevelt, the Secretary of State, Cordell Hull, the Secretary of War, Henry Stimson, the Army Chief of Staff, George Marshall, and Harold Stark, the uh, of the uh, U.S. Navy, the Chief of Naval Operations. Now, what did these messages reveal? They revealed that the Japanese had ordered their spies in Hawaii to start sending Tokyo the exact locations of our ships and dock in Pearl Harbor. Now, there's nothing unusual about spies watching ship movements, but when they're, they want to know the exact location of your ships and dock, the only implication is that your ships have been targeted. And as Pearl Harbor Day approached, Tokyo requested that the frequency of these reports be stepped up. The Purple Code transcripts also revealed that the Japanese in Germany had told the Germans that war with the United States was about to break out. They revealed that the Japanese had told their consulates and their embassy here in the United States to start burning all of their secret documents and their code books. Why? As soon as the war started, the Japanese knew they were going to lose their diplomatic immunity. Now, uh, I don't know if any of you saw a movie called Tora, Tora, Tora. In that movie, they showed the American Secretary of State, Cordell Hull, and that's the real Cordell Hull there. In the movie, the Japanese ambassador is given the declaration of war following the attack, and he reacts with utter shock and surprise. But in real life, Cordell Hull had already read the Japanese declaration of war the day before in his own office. He read his transcript of it that had been given to him by the cryptoanalysts, 13 parts of that 14-part message, as had President Roosevelt. Now, uh, Washington also knew from a number of other sources, Joseph Grew, our ambassador to Japan, had told Roosevelt, based on information received from the Peruvian embassy in Tokyo, that if relations got worse with the U.S., Japan planned to attack Pearl Harbor with all its strength and with all its might. J. Edgar Hoover, according to eyewitness testimony, also informed the president, based on information received from a Yugoslavian double agent named Dusko Popov, who you can see interviewed on the BBC documentary I mentioned before. Popov uh, was working for both us and the Germans, but his true loyalty was to us seems the Japanese had gone to the Germans to ask their advice on how to approach the attack on Pearl Harbor. Popov got that information to Hoover, who gave it to FDR, the president. Brigadier General Elliot Thorpe was a U.S. military observer in Java, which was at that time under the control of the Dutch. Now, the Dutch had also broken Japan's diplomatic codes, had learned of the Pearl Harbor attack, and warned General Thorpe. General Thorpe thought this was so serious, he sent a total of four warnings to Washington until finally, General Marshall's office told him, send no further warnings concerning Pearl Harbor. And you can see General Thorpe interviewed on the BBC documentary, Sacrifice at Pearl Harbor. Colonel F.G.L. Weigerman was the Dutch military attache in Washington. He has testified that he personally warned General Marshall of the attack. And Senator Guy Gillette and Congressman Martin Dyes both independently received warnings of the attack. Both men later stated they had told President Roosevelt about the warnings they'd received, and in both cases, he told them to just leave the information in his hands, the president's hands, and not to share it with anyone else. Now, in 2001, Disney released this movie, Pearl Harbor, starring Ben Affleck. It's a very standard rendering of the attack. FDR portrayed as a great hero. He's totally surprised. And the producer of that movie, Jerry Bruckenheimer, used very impolite language to describe anyone who would suggest otherwise. So in response to that, the New American Magazine asked me to do a new cover story on Pearl Harbor, uh, because at this point we had more information, 
in particular from this book, Day of Deceit, The Truth About FDR and Pearl Harbor by Robert Stinnett. Stinnett really broke new ground in the investigation of Pearl Harbor. Through the Freedom of Information Act, he was able to prove we'd not only broken the diplomatic code, we'd also broken Japan's naval codes before Pearl Harbor. This was something no one had known before outside of official circles. Um, we had always assumed that the Japanese maintained complete radio silence as they approached Pearl Harbor. They did not. They maintained discretion, but not silence. They broke silence on a number of occasions, and the most important message was certainly this one. Admiral Yamamoto, the Japanese first air fleet, November the 26th, 1941. The task force keep its movement strictly secret in maintaining close guard against submarines and aircraft shall advance into Hawaiian waters and upon the very opening of hostilities shall attack the main force of the United States fleet and deal it a mortal blow. The first air raid is planned for the dawn of X day, exact date, to be given by later order. Now, no one can read that and not understand its implications. I'd like to uh, mention that following publication of our articles in The New American, I received a note of thanks from Colonel Walter C. Short, U.S. Army retired, son of the late Pearl Harbor commander. We were also contacted by the attorney for the Kimmel family, who requested permission to use one of our New American articles in their own efforts to exonerate Admiral Kimmel. I'd also like to mention that by a uh, resolution of the United States Congress, Kimmel and Short have been exonerated of any wrongdoing in the matter of Pearl Harbor. But how many people know that? Uh, how many people even know there's any controversy about Pearl Harbor? Because you know what? You don't read about this stuff in the New York Times. You don't read about it in public school history books. Well, as we're going to find out tonight, there's a lot of things you don't find in those types of sources. Let's go back to World War I now. Now, what got us into World War I? They asked an historian, they'd give a number of different provocations, the Zimmerman note, but probably the incident that was most inflammatory to the public was the sinking of the Lusitania. Now, the Lusitania was a British passenger ship on its way from New York to England, 1915. At that time, England was at war with Germany, but we had not yet joined World War I. Well, the ship went down, and the Americans were told that the Germans simply sank this ship to be ruthless. They saw an innocent passenger ship, wanted to kill a lot of women and children, and so down it went. But that's not why the Germans sank it. They sank it because the Lusitania was loaded from one end to the other with munitions, millions of rounds of ammunition and many other munitions. Everyone who su survived that disaster said there were two explosions, a smaller one and then a huge one. The small one was a torpedo hitting. The large one was the munitions detonating. The ship went down in just 18 minutes after a single torpedo hit. By the way, that's confirmed also by the logbook of the sub that sank. Lusitania, the U-20's logbook said one torpedo followed by massive explosion. Equally significant, before the tragedy, Winston Churchill, who was then head of the British Admiralty, had ordered a study to be done to determine what the political impact would be if a British passenger ship was sunk with Americans on board. And there were almost 200 Americans on board the Lusitania. And prior to the sinking of the Lusitania, an exchange took place between Sir Edward Gray, the British Foreign Minister, and Edward Mandel House, who was President Woodrow Wilson's top advisor. Here's the exchange of communications. Gray, what will America do if the Germans sink an ocean liner with American passengers on board? House's reply, I believe that a flame of indignation would sweep the United States, and that by itself would be sufficient to carry us into the war. Joseph Kenworthy, who was then in British Naval Intelligence, Commander Kenworthy, said this, The Lusitania was deliberately sent at a considerably reduced speed into an area where a U-boat was known to be waiting and with their escorts withdrawn. What does he say? How can he say a U-boat was known to be waiting? Well, the British in 1915 had cracked Germany's naval codes, and they knew the approximate location of every U-boat at that time in the British Isles. They also knew the location of the U-boat, the U-20, by uh, reports of its recent activities. Now, in the United States, an official hearing investigation was, uh, was uh, carried into looking into the sinking of Lusitania. But at that hearing, officials were only allowed to see a dummy manifest that omitted the ship's munitions. The original manifest that listed the munitions was ordered by President Woodrow Wilson to be hidden in the archives of the U.S. Treasury. Now, hearing this, some of you might think, well, uh, Mr. Perloff, isn't that just sort of a conspiracy theory? Isn't that pretty wild stuff? Actually, almost everything I just said has already been on the History Channel. In the documentary In Search of the Lusitanium, you can read about it in the book The Lusitanium by a British historian, Colin Simpson. 
or in Room 40, which came out more recently by Patrick Beasley. Now, Beasley is a former officer in British naval intelligence, and he's considered the world's leading authority on the history of British naval intelligence. Here's what he writes in his book. I am reluctantly driven to the conclusion that there was a conspiracy, his words, to put the Lusitania at risk in the hopes that even an abortive attack on her would bring the United States into the war. All right, let's kick it back in history one more time now to the Spanish-American War. Now, what was the event that brought us into the Spanish-American War of 1898? Sticking to the main, that's right. Here's the main, the beautiful new battleship sailed into Havana Harbor in 1898. And a few days later, an enormous explosion tore through the ship. That's what it looked like afterwards. 266 crewmen, that's most of the crew, lost their lives. Soon thereafter, headlines like this began to appear. Um, crisis at hand, cabinet in session, growing belief in Spanish treachery, McKinley suspicious of Spanish plot. And so America went to war. It was said that the Spanish had uh, ordered the Maine to be sunk to intimidate us and that they sunk it either with a mine or a torpedo. And the battle cry was, remember the Maine. But after that war, American historians continued to ponder the question, what really did sink the Maine? Well, the Discovery Channel has done a pretty good job of answering that. In 2002, they released this documentary, Unsolved History, Death of the USS Maine. Now, what they did was they asked naval engineers and other scientists from various fields to recreate the sinking of the Maine. Now, they didn't do a computer model. Believe it or not, they actually reconstructed part of the hull of the main using the exact same kind of steel, exact same kind of rivets. They consulted the original blueprints for the main, and they uh, visited a sister ship, identical ship that's still afloat today before they did this. Then they took this hull, and they applied explosive pressure under differing conditions and compared the results they got to the photographed wreckage of the main. Now, the main no longer exists today, but at one point it had been raised and extensively photographed. Well, they were able to demonstrate from the results they got that there's no question that the main sank from an internal explosion. An external device like a torpedo or a mine creates a totally different effect on the hull. What does that mean? If correct, it means that in 1898, the United States went to war on a wrong pretext. Now, we started with Pearl Harbor in 1941. Let's start moving towards present time. Let's stop at the Korean War, 1950. The Korean War began in June of 1950 when Kim Il-sung, the dictator of North Korea, ordered his troops to invade South Korea. But here's a question I know very few people can answer this. How did Kim Il-sung and the communists come to power in North Korea? Uh, very few people have an answer to that. Some people think, well, did Mao Zedong put it there? No, Mao Zedong came to power in 49 in China. This guy was already in power in 45. The answer is that we pretty much put him there in a roundabout way. And here's how it happened. During World War II, Joseph Stalin was our ally against the Germans. Now, he's a bad guy to have for an ally. You might remember, when the Germans invaded Poland in 1939, so did he. Uh, and like uh, uh, the uh, Germans, he had put to death innumerable of his own people. Um, but nonetheless, he was our ally against Germany, but not against Japan. He had a non-aggression pact with Japan. But at the Big Three Conference of Yalta, President Roosevelt asked Stalin if he'd break his non-aggression pact with Japan. He said, sure, I'll do it on one condition. The United States has to supply everything my far eastern army will need. All the planes, tanks, jeeps, trucks, weapons, and food. You do that, and I'll send my army to fight the Japanese in the far east. And Roosevelt agreed. And 100 American ships were supposed to deliver supplies to U.S. GIs in the Pacific were diverted to the Soviet Union. Now, this has to go down as one of the worst foreign policy moves of all time. When does Stalin move into China to, quote unquote, fight the Japanese? After we've already dropped the atom bomb on Hiroshima. The Japanese surrendered less than a week away. There's no need to have Stalin come into that theater of the war. But there he goes, and he captures the Japanese uh, surrendered munitions without having to fight for them. And he turns those, as well as American Lend-Lease supplies, over to Mao Zedong for the overthrow of the nationalist government. But what about Korea? We're talking about Korea. Well, Korea until now has been a protectorate of Japan, a colony of Japan. What to do with it after the war? Well, as we'll see tonight, America's most influential journal of foreign policy is called Foreign Affairs. In 1944, Foreign Affairs ran an article called Korea in the post-war world. What they proposed was that after the war, Korea should be divided into a trusteeship. The same deal, you recall, was given to Germany. After the war, Germany was divided into east and west, right? 
We and the Allies got the West, and the Russians got the East. Foreign Affairs proposed the same deal for Korea. They said that after the war, we should take over the South and our noble co-victors in the Pacific, the Soviets, to get control of the North. Well, that proposal was put to Stalin by Harry Truman at the Potsdam Conference, and naturally he accepted. But I want to stress, this is an American idea. This is an American idea. Now, some people uh, might, I like to become my own critic once in a while, I might say something like this. Now, Mr. Perloff, look, so you have to understand, the guys who make our foreign policy are just good Joes like you and me. But sometimes they make mistakes, like all good Joes. Mr. Perloff, have you ever made a mistake? You have? Oh, what a surprise. So do the guys who make our foreign policy. Look, uh, yeah, we'll score you a point on the fact that it wasn't a good idea to let Stalin take charge of North Korea, okay? But you don't have to get all paranoid about it, you know? Look, it's easy for you to pass judgment on this stuff 60 years after the fact. But those guys were working with the information they had at that time. The fact of the matter is, Mr. Perloff, there's no sinister conspiracy here, okay? The fact of the matter is that what happened in Korea can be very simply explained by the fact that accidents do happen. The guys made a boo-boo, that's all. All right, well, before we dismiss this as a boo-boo, I want to point out that this little boo-boo cost over 50,000 American soldiers their lives in the Korean War and over 1.1 million Koreans. That's how many died in the Korean War. To say nothing of the untold suffering. I knew this was going to come up and hit me in the face. I told you that duct tape wouldn't hold. Um, um, to say nothing of the untold suffering of the North Korean people. Now, uh, before we dismiss this as a blunder, I want to quote somebody who did not think it was a blunder, and that's James Forrestal, who was Truman's Secretary of Defense. Uh, Forrestal noted that there were certain diplomats who were making decision after decision after decision that harmed the United States and benefited the Soviet Union. And he said, you know what? That can't be a mistake. Here's his actual quote. He said, consistency has never been a mark of stupidity. If the diplomats who have mishandled our relations with Russia were merely stupid, they would occasionally make a mistake in our favor. <laughs> By the way, uh, some of you guys know, how did James Forrestal die? Yeah, May the 22nd, 1949, he fell to his death from a window on the 16th floor of Bethesda Naval Hospital. Now, there's some people who have an explanation for that, too. Accidents do happen. Hey, it probably just uh, slipped on a banana peel and took a header out the window. It happens every day. No, if you want to do an interesting study, go on the internet and start uh, looking into the death of James Forrestal, which was no accident. But let's go on now to the Vietnam War. Now, what was the name of the resolution that authorized, the congressional resolution that authorized President Johnson to intervene? That's right, the Tonkin Gulf Resolution 1964, which was uh, supposed to be a response to an alleged attack on the U.S. Navy by North Vietnamese torpedo boats in the Gulf of Tonkin on August the 4th, 1964. Personally, I'm uh, in a torpedo boat. I don't think I'm going to try and attack the U.S. Navy. But um, one man who was there was this man, James Stockdale. Admiral Stockdale, recipient of the Congressional Medal of Honor, was a Navy pilot stationed in the Tonkin Gulf and flew to the scene at the time of the alleged attack. Eventually, he was uh, shot down and he spent several years in a communist concentration camp, returned to America, and eventually wrote his memoirs called In Love and War. I'm going to quote from his book, uh, what he witnessed on the day of the alleged Tonkin Gulf attack. Um, this quote is a little too long to put up on the screen, so bear with me. I'm going to pick it up from Stockdale's return to the aircraft carrier Ticonderoga. Wheeling into the ready room, I had heard the left three hours before, I came face to face with about 10 assorted ship's company, air group, and staff intelligence officers, all with sheepish grins on their faces. The mood of the group was informal and mirthful. Obviously, they had some big joke to tell me. When the hell's been going on out there, they laughingly asked. Damned if I know, I said. It's really a flap. The guy in the Maddox, that's one of the destroyers, air control radio, was giving blow bike blow accounts just like he did on Sunday. Turning left, turning right. Torpedoes to the right of us, torpedoes to the left of us. Boom, boom, boom. They got right down there, shot whatever they were shooting at came around toward the destroyers once, right on the deck, chasing some imaginary PT boat they said was running up behind them. Did you see any boats? Not a one. No boats, no boat wakes, no ricochets off boats, no boat gunfire, no torpedo wakes. Nothing but Black Sea and American firepower. For goodness sakes, I must be going crazy. How could all that commotion have been built up out there without something being behind it? Now, the next morning, Stockdale was woken by a young officer. 
Who are you? I asked. I'm the junior officer of the deck, sir. The captain sent me down to wake you. We got a message from Washington telling us to prepare to launch strikes against the beach, sir. What's the idea of the strikes? I asked. Reprisal, sir. Reprisal for what? For last night's attack on the destroyers, sir. I flipped on my bed lamp and the young officer left. I felt like I'd been doused with ice water. How do I get in touch with the president? He's going off half cocked. The fact that a war was being conceived out here in the humid muck of the Tonkin Gulf didn't bother me so much. But for the long pole, it seemed to me important that the grounds for entering war be legitimate. After there was a bad port, that we seemed to be under the control of a mindless Washington bureaucracy, vain enough to pick their own legitimacies, regardless of evidence. Now, let's bring it up to, um, oh, one more thing I want to mention about Tonga Gulf. As some of you may know, the Tonga Gulf Resolution was written before the Tonga Gulf incident took place. All right, war in Iraq. I just want to mention something here that uh, I have friends who are in Iraq or have fought there. And uh, Ed, uh, who opened us tonight up here, has a son who's serving as an officer right now in Iraq. And I know this is a controversial war. I just want to assure you that uh, none of us here are speaking critically out of unpatriotic motives. We regard patriotism as a virtue. I just want to say one thing about the war in Iraq, which is today we're being told we're in Iraq to bring freedom and democracy to the Iraqi people. But that's not what we were told before the war began. We were told it was all about weapons of mass destruction. You recall that Colin Powell went before the UN and said he had absolute proof of these weapons of mass destruction. And here's what he said. He said, my colleagues, every statement I make today is backed up by sources, solid sources. These are not assertions. We were giving you our facts and conclusions based on solid intelligence. And President Bush told the American people, Saddam Hussein and his weapons are a direct threat to this people, to this country, to our people, and to all free people. I will not leave the American people at the mercy of the Iraqi dictator and his weapons. And Tony Blair in Britain conjured up a picture for the uh, English people of uh, mushrooms shaped cloud going up over uh, London. He said this could happen on 45 minutes notice. But as many of you know, David Kay, the chief U.S. weapons inspector, publicly stated that after long searching, no weapons of mass destruction could be found. And that it was his opinion that these weapons had not existed since the first Gulf War of 91. And Colin Powell has acknowledged the statements he made before the U.N. were based upon faulty intelligence. Now, there are people who say that those weapons must have been moved to Iran and perhaps we should have a war and try to find them there. But here's what I want to point out. If you take a look at these six wars now, the uh, Spanish-American, World War I, World War II, Korea, Vietnam, and Iraq, a pretty good case could be made. Their involvement in each one of these wars was based on some act of deception or some kind of false pretext, or to put it most charitably, a mistaken pretext. Now, I'm going to suggest there's another common denominator to these six wars which is the same group of men who are behind all six. Now, if I was a critic, I was hearing this for the first time, I would say, uh, newsflash for you, Mr. Perloff, uh, the guys behind the Spanish-American war will be kind of dead now, don't you think so? How could they be behind the war in Iraq? Well, the organization I'm talking about is an organization that lasts the generations. There's many like that, right? For example, uh, Marx and Engels fund the Communist Party in 1848, yet more than 100 years later, long after Marx and Engels were dead, Mao Zedong took power with the communists in China. There's millions of Republicans uh, in America today, but the founders who go back to the days of Lincoln are all dead. The Christian church goes back to millennia. The mafia, they say, goes back for centuries. I'm talking about an organization like that. As older members are dying off, younger ones are coming in. Well, what organization am I talking about? Well, back in 1970 when I was a hippie, and this is not me, but I used to hang out with guys just like that. <laughs> is, very common back then to hear uh, uh, other hippies uh, smoking a marijuana cigarette, and they'd say, hey, man, you know, it's really the establishment that's running this country. They used to talk about the establishment, and hippies like to call themselves anti-establishment. And uh, what did they mean by that? Well, what they meant was that there's a wealthy elite in this country that really calls the shots. You know what? I do agree with that, but I disagree with the hippies on their characterization of the establishment. They thought the establishment was conservative, anti-communist, patriotic, and mostly Christian. In other words, it's basically like the John Birch Society, only a lot richer. <laughs> now, I think a pretty good definition of the establishment was written by Edith Kermit Roosevelt. She was uh, the granddaughter of Teddy Roosevelt and a syndicated columnist. 
Now, I think this description is kind of restrained, but it is a pretty good one coming from this source. She said, the word establishment is a general term for the power elite in international finance, business, and government who wield most of the power regardless of who's in the White House. Most people are unaware of the existence of this legitimate mafia, yet the power of the establishment makes itself felt to the professor who seeks a foundation grant to the candidate for a cabinet post or a State Department job. It affects the nation's policies in almost every area. I want to underscore two things that Roosevelt said. One is international finance. As we'll see today, the establishment is linked to Wall Street and the banking community. And also, regardless of who's in the White House, in other words, to these guys, it doesn't matter whether a Democrat or Republican sitting there, they still have the power. Now, some people might say this. Mr. Paroloff, you obviously don't know anything about American government. Because if you did, you know, we have government by, of the people, by the people, and for the people. You know what, Mr. Perloff? We, the voters, we've got all the power. Look, we're the ones who put these guys in office, right? So we get the government that we deserve. And obviously, any policy our government undertakes must be mandated by us because we are the ones who elect these leaders. And you know what, Mr. Perloff? If we don't like the job that our leaders are doing, all we've got to do is vote the rascals out at the next election. So see, Mr. Perloff, there's no sinister power behind the throne, okay? We, the people, the sovereign voters of America, we are the power behind the throne. You know, I agree that in principle, the people are supposed to have the power in this country, but I disagree that we're holding that power in fact. Now, the establishment knows we've got an electoral system and they've figured ways around it. For one thing, they figure that through their influence within the major mass media, and the two major parties, they can pretty much predetermine who will get nominated for president. Now, elections are not my focus tonight, but I just want to take one example of that just to back it up a little bit. 1976, Jimmy Carter was elected president. Here's a trivia question for you. Seven months before the Democratic National Convention, what percentage of registered Democrats favored Jimmy Carter for president? Anybody want to guess? Yeah, you're all very close. Yeah, it was less than 4%. Most people didn't even know who Jimmy Carter was. So what happened? Well, Carter was invited to the Terrytown, New York estate of David Rockefeller, uh, who many consider the kingmaker of the American establishment. Also there was the big new Brzezinski, uh, who Carter later made his national security advisor. And Barry Goldwater, many of you know, a former Republican presidential candidate, former senator from Arizona, wrote about this meeting between Carter and these two men. And here's what he said. David Rockefeller and his big new Brzezinski found Jimmy Carter to be their ideal candidate. They helped him win the nomination and the presidency. To accomplish his purpose, they mobilized the power of the Wall Street bankers and the media controllers. Let me flesh that in a little bit. Media controllers. By the time the nomination convention rolled around that summer, Carter's picture had appeared on the cover of Time magazine three times, and Time's cover artists were told to make him look as much like John F. Kennedy as possible. His picture appeared on Newsweek's cover twice by the time of the convention. The New York Times ran a number of puff pieces on Jimmy Carter, including a piece in the New York Times Magazine. The Wall Street Journal ran an editorial saying the best possible Democratic candidate making the best president for America would be Jimmy Carter. And of course, that swung the businessman vote. And every night, the three networks at that time, NBC, ABC, and CBS, inundated people with pictures of Jimmy Carter. And guess what? When the convention came around, Jimmy Carter got the nomination. But do you think that he got that nomination because all across America, the sovereign voters of America spontaneously decided that they wanted Jimmy Carter for president? Or was it because he was picked in a high place then packaged and sold to the American public? I respectfully suggest that it was the latter. And I also respectfully suggest that it's been the latter for most of our major party candidates over the last century. But it's not just about elections. The establishment has established bridges of, of influence to the sitting president, the most important of which is the Council on Foreign Relations, CFR for short, headquartered in New York City with a branch in Washington. And of course, it's the subject of my book, The Shadows of Power, subtitled The Council on Foreign Relations in the American Decline. Now, how does the council influence the president? We're going to talk about that. But first, I'd like to establish this. What is the goal of the Council on Foreign Relations? The goal is world government. And I'm just going to quote Admiral Chester Ward. He was former judge advocate of the U.S. Navy. He was invited into membership in the Council on Foreign Relations. He spent 16 years there. He was shocked by what he found. Here's what he wrote. He said, the main purpose 
of the Council on Foreign Relations is promoting the disarmament of U.S. sovereignty and national independence and submergence into an all-powerful one-world government. I'm up from Boston. We have the Boston Herald up there. They even were uh, bold enough to do an editorial against the Council on Foreign Relations, which they call them foreign policy fuzzy thinkers who worship world government. And in my book, The Shadows of Power, I have many quotes, both from the critics and from the council itself, demonstrating that they advocate the establishment of a world government. By the way, what do we mean by that? What do we mean by world government? Well, today, Brazil is run by the Brazilian government, right? And Japan runs, uh, the Japanese government runs Japan. A world government would be a single government ruling the entire globe. Now, some people would think, ah, oh, come on, Mr. Perloff, that's never going to happen in a million years. We know what's happening right now in Europe, the European Union. You know, at one time, countries like Spain and England were mighty empires. Now they're becoming little more than provinces in the European Union. Their legislatures each year uh, increasingly serve just to ratify decisions made uh, by the European Commission in Brussels. And as you know, they're consolidating their currencies into the euro. They're consolidating their militaries. Gonna, they say they're going to have a uh, European Pentagon. Uh, they have European Constitution. Europe right now is a model of global government on a regional scale. And as we'll see tonight, the same thing is planned for North America. Now, uh, the Journal of Foreign Policy for the Council of Foreign Relations is called Foreign Affairs. And I read every issue, well, I went through every issue before writing The Shadows of Power, going back to its original publication date of 1922, and I found many calls for world government. For example, in the first year of publication, 1922, we read this. Obviously, there's going to be no peace or prosperity for mankind so long as it remains divided into 50 or 60 independent states. The real problem today is that of world government. I mean, to score something that was said here, I found that these guys constantly use the words peace and prosperity to describe what world government will bring us. What they say is, there's nothing worse than war, right? The only reason we have war is that we have different countries. These countries make war on each other. Now, if we just lived under a world government, We'd all live in peace, brotherhood, and happiness. Well, contradicting that is uh, this man, Professor Rudolf Rummel, Professor Emeritus of Political Science at the University of Hawaii, he did an interesting study on death in the 20th century. And what he found, he found that in that century, four times more people died at the hands of their own government than died in war. So it seems that there is something worse than war, which is totalitarian government. The question you've got to ask is, if we have a world government, who's going to run it? Now, globalists will say, well, international coalitions are great. Look at how they stopped Saddam Hussein. What happens if Saddam Hussein runs your world government? If you've got only one government in, uh, on the earth, where are you going to run to hide? There's no government now you can run to to protect you. The founding fathers of America knew that it's very dangerous to put all power in one place. That's why they didn't just give us a president and the executive branch. But they also gave us a legislative branch. And even with that, there's a check and a balance, right, between the House and the Senate plus the judicial branch to keep an eye on the other two. And I know that there's been corruption in all those branches of government. But nonetheless, that system has uh, served to protect us from being taken over by a dictatorship. And by the way, in the original view of the framers, the states were supposed to counteract, uh, counterbalance the power of the federal government, an issue that was sort of settled by the war between the states. Um, James Madison, our fourth president, said this, the accumulation of all power in the same hands may be pronounced the very definition of tyranny. You can be sure if you accumulate all power in the world government, it would be the worst tyranny this planet has ever seen. All right, well, what about this Council on Foreign Relations? How did it get started? It traces its roots back to the Paris Peace Conference of 1919, which was suddenly in the aftermath of World War I. And President uh, Woodrow Wilson, who's on the right there, uh, went to that conference, and uh, always at his side was his top advisor, Edward Mandel House. Uh, Colonel House not a real colonel, that was an honorary title given to him, was known as a front man for Wall Street and the banking community. He had an office right in the White House. It could well uh, accurately be said he was Wilson's controller. House's official biographer, Charles Seymour, called him the unseen guardian angel of the Federal Reserve Act. Now, I'm going to be talking to you folks for a little while about banking and financial institutions. And it might seem like I've pulled a switch on you. You may say, uh, Mr. Perloff, you started talking about foreign policy and war, and now you're talking about banking, uh, why the switch? Well, as we're going to see, the financial establishment is inextricably tied to the foreign policy establishment. You can't understand one 
without understanding the other. So bear with me, and the relationship will soon become apparent. By the way, it's not surprising that a plan for world control would be tied to financial centers. What do we say buys the most influence in this world, humanly speaking? We say money makes the world go round, right? And we want to know who's behind something. What do we say? We say, follow the money. Well, that's what we're going to do now is follow the money and see who's behind the Council on Foreign Relations. Speaking of money, I'm sure you've noticed we've got inflation in this country. I was looking at price levels in 1962 the other day. 1962, a postage stamp was four cents, a candy bar was a nickel, and a movie theater ticket was 50 cents. I went to Colby College freshman in 1969. The tuition was 2,600, now up to about $40,000. My father brought a brand new Toyota Corolla in 1969 for $2,400. Um, you know, the dollar's lost more than 95% of its value since 1913. And uh, it looks like it's inevitable we're going to have inflation, you know. Uh, we're told it's inevitable as death and taxes. It does look that way. You know, every year for the last 50 years, we've had inflation, not deflation. That's true. If you look at the consumer price index, the CPI, every year we've had inflation, not, not deflation. So it looks inevitable, but it's not. Um, by the way, uh, how does the establishment try to explain inflation? They explain it kind of like this. Uh, you know, it's the fault of the American worker. Some guy has a baby, and he goes to his boss. He says, boss, I just had a baby. Can I have a raise of $20 a week? And the boss says, well, Joe, I'd like to give you a raise of $20 a week. The only way I can afford to do that is by raising our prices $20 a week. I'll have to pass that cost on to our customers. So the guy is doing business with Joe's company. Say, well, you guys are raising your prices $20 a week. We'll have to do the same thing. So all across America, prices go up because greedy Joe had a baby. And as for raise, and guy, guys like him, right? Well, that's one of the ex explanations we're giving. Well, that's not the case. In inflation is not inevitable. I'm going to show you a very interesting graph. These are price levels in America going back to 1665. And I want you to notice that for the first 250 years of our history, we had no net inflation. It's only over the last century we've had this skyrocketing inflation. Now, some people might object and say, hey, Mr. Perloff, there's some blips in there. Yeah, what are those blips? Those blips are wars. The first one is the Revolutionary War, the second one is the War of 1812, the third one is the Civil War. In wartime, our government, like many governments, has printed money to pay the cost of the war. You know what happens when you print money, you get inflation, right? But notice that after the wars, money returned to its normal value. Did you know that $1,900 a was worth exactly what it was worth in 1770, the days of George Washington? No net inflation for 130 years. But look at this war, World War I. All of a sudden, we, we inflate again. And it starts to go back down, and that's mostly the, the Great Depression when we had some deflation. And then it just takes off. Well, what happens? Something's obviously changed. You know, there's no effect without a cause. What's the cause of that change in America? And the change was caused by the introduction of the Federal Reserve. Now, I know that Ben Bernanke has taken over at the Fed, but I still have Greenspan's picture up there. It's still, I think, a more familiar face to most Americans. Now, the Fed chairman has been called the economic czar of America. Why? Because he sets interest rates in this country. By doing that, he and the board, I should say, set the interest rates. By doing that, they also set the tenor of the stock market. You know, if interest rates are really high, CDs start to look attractive, money starts flowing out of the stock market. Or conversely, if interest rates are low, money tends to move into the stock market, pushing uh, stock prices higher. And, you know, mutual fund managers are always listening to when the Fed chairman speaks very nervously with their, their uh, thumbs on the buy and sell button. Uh, hoping to get some hint of the direction that interest rates are going to take. Now, how did the Federal Reserve get started? Most people would say, I have no clue. It must have been some act of our government, right? Yes, it was the Federal Reserve Act, 1913. But who introduced the original legislation for the central bank? It was this man, Senator Nelson Aldrich. Now, you might not have heard of Senator Aldrich, but I bet you've heard of this man, Nelson Rockefeller, who was vice president under Ford, governor of New York for a long time, a billionaire, one of the richest men in the world. His full name was Nelson Aldrich Rockefeller. It was named for his grandfather, Nelson Aldrich. The Rockefellers and the Aldriches intermarried. Uh, uh, Aldrich's son, Winston Aldrich, became president of the um, National City Bank, owned by the Rockefellers. And when Aldrich spoke on Capitol Hill, when Senator Aldrich spoke, people understood he was speaking for the Rockefellers and their allies. Now, something I want to port, point out to you that's important. The legislation that he brought forward in the Senate was not written by him. He didn't write a word of it. It was written at a secret meeting of the world's most powerful bankers at J.P. Morgan's hunting club on Jekyll Island off the coast of Georgia. 
Now, some people would say, oh, come on, Mr. Perloff, you don't expect us to believe that, okay? What evidence is there that this conspiracy took place? Okay, well, it's well documented now. Actually, the first man to write it up was actually B.C. Forbes, the founder of Forbes magazine. And one of the men who was there later wrote about it in his memoirs. That's Frank Vandelip, who was a president of National Citibank. You've all heard of Citibank. It used to be called National Citibank, owned by the Rockefellers. And Vandelip was his president. And here's what he said in his memoirs. There was an occasion near the close of 1910 when I was as secretive, indeed as furtive as any conspirator. I do not feel there's any exaggeration to speak of our secret expedition to Jekyll Island as the occasion of the actual conception of the Federal Reserve System. We were told to leave our last names behind us. We were told further that we should avoid dining together on the night of our departure. We were instructed to come one at a time and as unobtrusively as possible to the terminal of the New Jersey Littoral of the Hudson, where Senator Aldrich's private car would be in readiness attached to the rear end of the train to the south. Once aboard the private car, we began to observe the taboo that had been fixed on last names. Discovery, we knew, simply must not happen. If it would be discovered that our particular group had got together and written a banking bill, that bill would have no chance whatever of passage by Congress, unquote. Okay, who's at this meeting? Representatives of the three most powerful banking houses in the world. It's kind of like a meeting of the Mafia Don. Representing the House of Rockefeller are Vandalip, and Aldrich. Representing the house of J.P. Morgan, from left to right, are Benjamin Strong, head of J.P. Morgan's Bankers Trust Company. In the middle is Henry Davison, senior partner in J.P. Morgan and Company. And on the right is Charles Norton of the First National Bank, also owned by Morgan. But the most powerful figure at this meeting was the man representing Europe's Rothschild family, Paul Warburg. Now, you might not have heard of Warburg, uh, but if you've ever seen the musical Annie or the old comic strip, Little Orphan Annie, you've seen him caricaturized. You might recall that Annie had a rich benefactor, the richest man in the world, named Daddy Warbucks. Well, the cartoonist simply took the name Warburg and changed it to Warbucks. Actually, myself, I think that this fictional banker is a better representation <laughs> of uh, Warburg. But uh, who, who was Warburg? Well, Paul Warburg was a German banker, a partner with a the Rothschilds, who'd grown rich in Europe by establishing central banks to loan money to the governments of Europe. And in 1902, the Rothschilds sent Warburg to America with instructions to found a similar bank here in the United States. As soon as he, he came here, he became a partner in Kuhn Loban Company, which was the Rothschild banking satellite in New York City. And he quickly formed an alliance with John D. Rockefeller and J.P. Morgan. Now, this alliance was nothing new. It went way back. The Rothschilds had actually provided the original seed money for the standard oil fortune of Rockefeller. They'd also bailed out J.P. Morgan when his firm was in trouble in the 19th century. Now, in 1907, J.P. Morgan, who owned a large number of newspapers, started a rumor about the insol insolvency of a couple of rival banks, namely the Knickerbocker Bank of New York and the Trust Company of America. This led to runs on these banks. If you've seen that movie, It's a Wonderful Life, you've seen an example of a run on the bank. You know, uh, banks loan out the money that's on deposit. That's how they make their profits. But if all the uh, uh, depositors were to panic and run to the bank and ask for their money, and the bank had loaned out too much of it, the bank could collapse. That's what happened to these two banks. This spread to other banks and became known as the Panic of 1907. Immediately following that, Morgan's newspapers and, and uh, uh, Rockefeller's newspapers and Senator Aldrich began clamoring, America must have a central bank to prevent any repetition of such a crisis, and that became the Federal Reserve. Now, why do they want a central bank? Well, who do you suppose Woodrow Wilson points vice chairman of the original Federal Reserve will set America's interest rates? Bum, Paul Warburg. The very guy who ran the meeting on Jekyll Island is now put in charge of the system. Who's put in charge of the New York Federal Reserve, the system's nucleus? Benjamin Strom. The very guys who devised the Federal Reserve Act are now given control of the system. In other words, the coyotes are now in charge of the hen house. But why do they want a central bank? Well, Paul Warburg at Kuhn Loeb was making an annual salary of $500,000 a year. That's a lot of money back then. That's equivalent to more than $10 million a year now. Um, Paul Warburg gave up that position to accept a job on the Federal Reserve Board, a position that paid only $12,000 a year. Now, why did he do that? Some people might say, well, Jim, I'm sure that um, when Warburg came to this country, he must have gotten caught up in a frenzy of patriotism. 
And in this mad frenzy of patriotism, he altruistically gave up his job at Kuhn Loeb to get joined the Federal Reserve Board and stabilize the American economy. I don't think that was it. I think Paul Warburg said to himself, why should I make a piddling, diddling 500000 at Kuhn Loeb when I can make countless millions for myself and my friends in high finance by setting interest rates in this country on the Federal Reserve Board? Snap my fingers once, stock market's going to go up. Snap them twice, stock market's going to go down. Now, I feel a critic coming on. Charles Lindbergh Sr. was one of, the, one of the most eminent men in Congress and helped lead the fight against the Federal Reserve. That's right, there was a fight against the Federal Reserve. There are many who I could quote on this, but I'm going to quote Congressman Lindbergh because his name has recognition value. Here's what he said when the bill was being debated. Here's what he said on the floor of the House. This act establishes the most gigantic trust on earth. When the president signs this act, the invisible government by the money power, proven to exist by the money trust investigation, will be legalized. Let's stop right there. What does he mean by the money power? He's talking about the alliance between the houses of Rockefeller, Morgan, and Rothschild. The money power overawes the legislative and executive forces of the nation. I have seen these forces exerted during the different stages of this bill. From now on, depressions will be scientifically created. The new law will create inflation whenever the trust wants inflation. If the trust can get a period of inflation, they figure they can unload stocks on the people at high prices during the excitement, then bring on a panic and buy them back at low prices. The people may not know it immediately, but the day of reckoning is only a few years removed. Now these words by Lindbergh were pure political prophecy. Was there inflation, like he said? Yeah, take a look. As soon as you get the Federal Reserve, that's when your inflation starts occurring. Was there a stock market excitement, like he said, with uh, the people uh, entering into a panic stage where the, uh, the rich could buy them back at low prices? Yes, that was the stock market crash of 1929. Now, see these guys here? We have uh, Warburg, John D. Rockefeller, the younger J.P. Morgan has now taken over for his father. Bernard Baruch, another banker who operated within this cartel. Joseph P. Kennedy sort of operated at the fringes of the establishment. These guys were all out of the stock market in 1929. Now, if you consult their biographies, it says that it was because of their wisdom, their financial wisdom. They weren't foolish like the millions of small investors who were wiped out in 1929. But I suggest there's another reason, which is control. If you knew in 1929 that the Federal Reserve was about to jack up interest rates, you could be out of the market. Louis McFadden, Congressman McFadden, was head of the chairman of the House Banking Committee. He said this of the stock market crash of 1929. It was not accidental. It was a carefully contrived occurrence. The international bankers sought to bring about a condition of despair here so they might emerge as rulers of us all. When the Federal Reserve Act was passed, the people of these United States did not perceive that a world banking system was being set up here, a super state controlled by international bankers acting together for their own pleasure a quote you didn't find in the New York Times. Curtis Dahl was Franklin D. Roosevelt's son-in-law. He was a broker for Lehman Brothers. He was on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange on Black Friday in 1929. He said this of the crash. It was the calculated shearing of the public by the world money powers. But the Fed was not just about controlling the stock market. What of number two was creation of money from nothing. Now there's a book that really details this well. I recommend it to you very strongly. It's called The Creature from Jekyll Island by G. Edward Griffin, best book that's out there on the Fed. It's about sold out now, right, Ed? We do have, I think, one copy back there for sale. We'll be taking orders for more. This is a fabulous book. I consider it one of the 10 most important political books that you can read. Um, now, we have a very expensive government, as you know. In fact, uh, over the last five years, the average federal deficit has been over $300 billion a year which means that on a given day, our government spends about a billion more than it takes in. Now, how does our government take in money? Through taxes, right, collecting taxes, and also through sale of bonds. Actually, bonds are kind of a lousy way to fund the government because it's just money that the government borrows and has to repay later, plus interest. Nonetheless, if you take all the money from taxes and bonds, it still isn't enough to meet the federal budget. So, how does the government get away with that? I mean, how can they keep paying defense contractors and Medicare uh, recipients and uh, welfare recipients when they're not taking in the money. Where do they get the money from? They get it from the Fed. I'm going to loosely borrow an illustration given by Mr. Griffin in his book. Let's say that the uh, federal government is short a billion dollars it needs to pay the salaries of the employees of the federal government. Here's what they do. Congress sends a uh, representative of the Treasury over to the Fed building, which is on the right. And at the Fed, an officer literally writes out a check for $1 billion to the U.S. Treasury. 
Now, what we want to point out here is this is not based on any assets that the Fed holds. No assets are being withdrawn to, from the Fed. It's fiat money. It's money created from nothing. Now, if you or I did that, we wrote a check with nothing to back it up, we'd go to jail. But the Fed can do it. It's legal. They call it monetizing the debt. Now, some people would say, well, Mr. Perloff, that, um, that helps our government uh, meet its uh, obligations. How did that ever help the bankers? Well, for one thing, by creating money from nothing, they gave the U.S. government a license to spend money on wars and other policies that the establishment wanted them to undertake without limit. And of course, corporations like your modern Bechtel and Halliburton could now become the recipients of great government largesse when the government could create money from nothing. But it also benefited the bankers directly. These guys who sat at Jekyll Island were no stooges. They understood what they were doing. They knew this. What are the employees of the federal government going to do with that billion dollars in salary that's just been created from nothing? They're going to go deposit it in their banks. You've just created a billion dollars in bank deposits for nothing. How does a banker make his money? By loaning out the money on deposit. The more that's on deposit, the more he can loan out and the richer he can get. By the way, that one billion actually becomes 10 billion because under the Federal Reserve's rules, a bank needs to have only one dollar on deposit for every 10 that it, it loans out. What did that mean for the bankers? It meant big time profits. What did it mean for us? It meant inflation, no inflation prior to the Fed. Now this is a woman in Germany in the 1920s. She's using money in her stove as fuel. You probably heard the great German inflation of the 1920s. To pay off their war debt, the Germans printed massive amounts of money. It was so bad, the inflation, that it took 200 million marks just to buy a loaf of bread. And people used to walk down the street with their money in a wheelbarrow. Well, when the Fed creates money from nothing, it's doing the same thing. Now, that's not as bad as in Germany in the 1920s, but they're doing the same thing. And they don't even have to print the money nowadays. They just create it electronically. How can you fight a war in Iraq and not raise taxes? You inflate the currency. Now, I should mention that politicians love this system. You know why? They know if you raise taxes, that's a kiss of death at election time. But if you fund the government by simply creating more money, who do we blame? Do we blame the government or the Fed? No, we blame the grocery store. Why are you raising prices again? We blame the, you know, college tuition is going up. We blame the college. We never look at the actual source, which is the government. But the bankers had a problem. Okay, we're, we're creating billions of dollars from nothing. But to be profitable, those deposits have to be loaned to somebody. Now, who do you suppose they wanted to loan that money to? They were creating from nothing. Think they wanted to loan it to a guy like me? No. For one thing, I don't borrow that much. Also, my business might go belly up. They wanted to loan it to one particular individual. You know who it was? This man right here. That's right. They wanted to take the money they, they created from nothing by the Fed and loan it right back to Uncle Sam, which brings us to reason number three for the Fed, interest on loans to the American government. The Fed was empowered to buy and sell bonds for the federal government and to have a voice in setting the rates on those bonds. And who was going to buy up those bonds? Naturally, they would. So of course, you and I can buy a bond too, but the bankers knew very well that they were going to buy most of them. But they still had a problem. How's the American government going to pay back all the interest on all this debt? Because in 1913, the American government had very few sources of revenue. Its biggest source of revenue at that time was tariffs. You know what they came up with? They came up with the income tax. Some people don't know there was no income tax in this country before 1913. In fact, in 1895, the Supreme Court ruled that an income tax was unconstitutional. The only way to get an income tax enacted was to pass an amendment or try to pass an amendment to the Constitution. Now, who introduced the income tax amendment? You only get one guess on this. What legislator? Nelson Aldrich. Nelson Aldrich, the same man who introduced the original legislation for our central bank. Now, why did the American people accept the income tax? Uh, yeah, that, and um, also originally it was only 1% of your income. And naturally, Senator Aldrich and all the other co-sponsors promised, don't worry, it'll never go above 1%. So Americans said, hey, I'm a patriotic Joe. If Uncle Stan needs 1% of my income and I always can keep the other 99%, no problem. But you know what happened? A few years later, Congress raised it a smidge and then another smidge until after a few smidges, we're all paying 18, right, 28, 33% of our income in federal income tax because the bankers understood this principle. If you want to boil a frog, you can't just drop him in boiling water. He'll jump out. If you want to boil a frog, put him in lukewarm water and gradually turn up to a boil and he'll never even know he's been cooked. And that's what they did with the income tax. The intention all along was to raise it from the 1%. Now, some people would say this, uh, Jim, 
uh, that's foolish. The, the rich wouldn't want an income tax. The income tax soaks the rich. Well, it's true. If you know a guy who's making one hundred or two hundred thousand dollars a year, that guy probably pays a lot of tax, but not these guys. Now, in 1970, when I was 18, I worked for Kelly Labor in downtown Boston at minimum wage, $1.80 an hour. You know, I paid more income tax that year than the billionaire Nelson Rockefeller, who didn't pay one cent in income tax. How do we know that? Because when he became vice president in the 40, he had to reveal his income tax returns. Uh, back in the 1930s, the Bacora hearings revealed that J.P. Morgan had not paid any income tax at all in 1931 and 1932. How do these guys get away with it? Well, the main way is they put their assets into tax-free foundations, which is a whole other subject we're not going into tonight. But those foundations serve to further the power and influence of the establishment, for example, by providing uh, funds for colleges to force them to teach a certain agenda to their students. Now, look at these dates with me, 1913, 1913, 1914. Now, in 1913, the bankers have established the Federal Reserve, which enables them to make billions of dollars out of nothing, which they can loan to the federal government at interest rates they themselves will set. Also in 1913, they've established the income tax by which they can extract repayment from the American people. Only one thing is missing. America needs a reason to borrow. Now, if only something would happen that would cause the American people to borrow money, if only something would happen that caused a lot of borrowing, what happened in 1914? Six months after the Federal Reserve Act was passed, Archduke Ferdinand is assassinated, America later goes to war, and as a result of that, our federal deficit, which was one billion, pretty manageable sum, one billion before the war, became 25 billion by the end of the war, and we've never looked back on debt since. Now, some people have another explanation for these dates, which is, hey, stuff happens. You know, <laughs> it's all a coincidence. Now, as you heard in the introduction, um, I've written a couple of books on creation versus evolution. I give PowerPoints on that. And what I talk about there is the evidence that God designed the world, that the world has far too much complexity and design in it. I talk about the fact that the, the goodness in the world is designed. And people sometimes ask me, what's the, what's the relationship between your two talks? Well, the relationship between that and tonight's talk is, I'm also saying that evil also occurs by design. Do I believe accidents happen? I sure do, but not in politics. Now, some people might say this, uh, Mr. Perloff, you know, the Federal Reserve and income tax, why, that's, those are underpinnings of our free enterprise system here. There is Americanist mom, apple pie, baseball, and the American flag. Mr. Perloff, to criticize these things, you sound like a darn communist. Well, if you think that, you need to read the Communist Manifesto, because in that book, Karl Marx laid out 10 steps necessary to create a communist totalitarian state. Step two was a heavy progressive or graduated income tax. And step five was centralization of credit in the hands of the state by means of a national bank with state capital and an exclusive monopoly. So in 1913, we actually enacted two of Marx's precepts for the establishment of a communist state. This is not part of free enterprise. The founding fathers never intended for you to have an income tax. It was not in the Constitution. As far as the creation of money goes, the Constitution says Congress, our elected representatives, shall have the power to coin money and regulate the value thereof, not private bankers. Now, Young people today are really struggling, you know? Money troubles, fights over money. And, um, you know, a young man today will say sometimes, well, you know, my great-grandfather came to this country in 1900. He had 10 kids, his own house, his wife never worked a job. How did he do it? You know, me and Mindy, we got one kid, two jobs, we can barely make the rent. Well, when great-grandpa came here, there was no income tax. Now, people today are spending about half their income, workers, that is, on tax. It's true when you take your income tax, federal income tax, state income tax, social security tax, real estate tax, sales tax, excise tax, all the other taxes, you're spending about half your uh, earnings on taxes. Now, does it make sense that if you lose half your money to taxes, you'll need two jobs now to make up the difference? Plus, when great grandpa came here in 1900, he had a stable dollar. It's worth the same next year as last year. Uh, so, we have a problem on our hands, but the bankers, I want you to know, they're really sorry about all this trouble they've caused, and they've come up with a solution. <laughs> Say. <laughs> We're really sorry about all this inflation and tax. We know you can't make ends meet, so that's why we send you three credit card offers in the mail every day. We feel really bad. 
course, who will have to charge you 12% interest on that? You know how that works though? They, they create the situation where you don't have enough money, and then what do we do? We have to go right back to them to get the money. Good voice, that Greenspan. <laughs> well, when the Federal Reserve uh, was being planned on Jekyll Island in 1910, the president at that time was William Howard Taft. And uh, Taft was opposed to the Aldrich plan for a central bank. For that reason, the bankers decided to get rid of him. And the man they chose to replace him was Woodrow Wilson. Now, uh, Wilson, prior to running, met with Bernard Baruch, who was part of the cartel, and he promised Baruch he would do four things if he was made president. He would lend an ear to advice on who should occupy his cabinet. He would support a central bank. He would support an income tax. And he would lend an ear to advice if a war broke out in Europe. Now, the problem was how to get this stiff-looking professor from Princeton elected over the very popular incumbent, William Howard Taft. The strategy they used was to split the Republican vote. J.P. Morgan and company put money on the former Republican president, Teddy Roosevelt, who ran what was called the Bull Moose, the short-lived Bull Moose ticket. And Republicans split their votes between Taft and Roosevelt, and Wilson got elected with only 42% of the vote. Watch the career of Woodrow Wilson take off after the establishment gets behind him. In 1910, he's a political unknown, president of Princeton, no political experience. 1911, with the establishment behind him, he's elected governor of New Jersey. You have to give this guy a little political experience before he can run him for president. 1912, with the full power of the media, which in those days meant newspapers behind him, Wilson's elected president. In 1913, the Federal Reserve and income tax become reality, his first year in office. 1914, World War I begins. 1915, the Lusitania goes down. Wilson hides the manifest, if you remember that. 1916, Wilson is re-elected on the campaign slogan, he kept us out of war. But as soon as he's re-elected, he moves to get a congressional uh, declaration of war, which he achieves in 1917. 1918, the Germans surrender. America's entry into the war having turned the balance of power against them. And in 1919, the Paris Peace Conference convenes to settle the aftermath of the war. Who does Wilson appoint to head the US delegation to the Paris Peace Conference? Paul Warburg. According to Wilson, only Warburg is qualified to run the Fed or to represent America at the Paris Peace Conference. Who does Wilson appoint to be his economic advisor at the conference? Bernard Baruch, the same man he made those pledges to before running. And always at his side, Edward Mandelhaus, the banker's front man. Now, Wilson's chief proposal, of course, at the Paris Peace Conference, the one he's most famous for, was the League of Nations. Many people think he originated that concept. He did not. It originated with House, who we see here at the Paris Peace Conference, and the bankers. Ray Stannard Banker was, Woody Wilson's official biography said this, practically nothing, not a single idea in the covenant of the League was original with the president. Charles Seymour, who was House's official biographer, said, Wilson approved the House draft almost in its entirety, and his own rewriting of it was practically confined to phraseology. Now, what were the bankers after? They were after a world government. Now, some people might say, uh, Mr. Perloff, you said at the outset these uh, establishment guys wanted an all-powerful world government. I got news for you. The League of Nations was not all-powerful, man. It was very weak. That's right, because the bankers understood a principle. If you want to boil a frog, you got to put him in lukewarm water, and he'll never know he's been boiled. You start with a weak world government because in 1919, there's no way the sovereign nations of the world would have put up with an all-powerful world government. But how did America react to the Versailles Treaty that created the League of Nations? Well, the Founding Fathers, in their wisdom, had said that no president can make a treaty on his own. It has to be ratified by the Senate. The Senate did not approve of Wilson's idea of the League of Nations, and they refused to ratify the Versailles Treaty, so he didn't enter the League. How do the bankers respond? They're still in Paris. They are ripped when they find out that America's not going to join the League. So they held a series of meetings hosted by Edward Mandel House, culminating with a dinner at the Majestic Hotel in Paris. And at this last dinner, they resolved to form a new organization in the United States that would so change the climate of opinion here that would enter the realm of world government. And that organization, the Council on Foreign Relations, incorporated in New York City 
two years later. Now then, if you look at the original membership roster of the council, you'll find something interesting. Almost every man on it was either a banker or an attorney for J.P. Morgan and Company. For example, the founding president was John W. Davis, who was Morgan's personal attorney. The founding vice president was Paul Cravath, attorney for J.P. Morgan and Company. The founding chairman was Russell Leffingwell, partner in J.P. Morgan and Company. Now, don't you think it's kind of odd that a foreign policy association should comprise solely bankers and lawyers working for J.P. Morgan? Well, they thought it looked a little funny, too. So uh, they decided to add a few college professors to the ranks. But guess what? The professors all came from universities indebted to J.P. Morgan and Company for large endowments. They're all screened, and they're all men that they knew they could count upon to attend meetings at the council and return to their campuses and tell their students that if America were truly civilized, she would join the League of Nations. Now eventually, the Rock bless you, eventually the Rockefellers brought in their people, and David Rockefeller was the chairman for many, many years, is still the honorary chairman of the council. Now, how does the council influence American foreign policy? One way is through its books, its many books on foreign policy, which are generally, uh, you, can, you can count on them getting good reviews in the New York Times book review section. Also, through its journal, Foreign Affairs. Now, a lot of people, most people never heard of Foreign Affairs, but you know what? Time Magazine calls this the most influential journal in print. It's like the Bible of the State Department. Uh, it said that if you want to know what American foreign policy will be doing tomorrow, just read Foreign Affairs today. But the most important way, I'm sure, that the Council influences American foreign policy is by directly supplying cabinet-level personnel for Washington. At the time I wrote The Shadows of Power, but that was 20 years ago. At that time, when Reagan was president, even at that time, 14 secretaries of state, 14 secretaries of the treasury, and 11 defense secretaries had been recruited from the ranks of the council. You're not talking about a huge organization. In the days of Kennedy, only about 1,000 members. It is up to about 6,000 now. Uh, Bill Clinton picked 12 cabinet members from the council. Virtually every CIA director and Fed chairman has come from the council. If you want to know how the current candidates stack up, um, the Washington Post this year published a list of their uh, top security and foreign policy advisors. For McLean, 18 out of 34 belong to the council. For Obama, 10 out of 23. And for Hillary, 14 out of 21. So if any one of them gets elected, you can expect you're not going to see too much change. Now, what foreign policy programs has the council actually created? I'm going to take three examples from right after World War II. What was the successor organization to the League of Nations? The United Nations. Now, what I was told in public school was this. My teacher said, well, boys and girls, here's how the UN got started. After World War II, all the nations of the world were really sick of war. So they decided to get together and form an organization that would stop war. That's not how it happened. It was started with a group called the Informal Agenda Group. It's a group of Council on Foreign Relations members. If that title sounds bland and innocuous, it's designed to be that way because they didn't want any snoopy congressmen prying into what they were doing. But they drew up the original plans for the UN. They called in three attorneys, all members of the CFR, who approved of it and said it would be constitutional. Then they had an audience with President Roosevelt, who also approved the plan, and announced it to the public the very same day, and then made that the central priority of his post-war planning, establishment of the UN. And when the UN was founded in San Francisco in 1945, 47 of the American delegates were members of the council. It was a CFR show all the way. How about the Marshall Plan, the post-war plan to help Europe? People will say, well, uh, that was thought up by General George Marshall. He announced it at a Harvard commencement speech. That's what it says in your history book, and he did announce it at a commencement speech at Harvard, but it had nothing to do with planning it. Actually, it was all laid out at a study group at the Council on Foreign Relations with David Rockefeller as its secretary. Originally, they were going to call it the Truman Plan and have President Truman announce it. But after some deliberation, they said, you know, if Truman announces it, the Republicans might not go for it. You know, they may call this a new deal for Europe. So General Marshall was selected because they felt that as a general, he would appear to be a political neutral, and that plan worked. The plan got bipartisan support. Well, what were they trying to do with the Marshall Plan? We were told it was charity for Europe. Well, for one thing, corporations linked to the CFR we're given tax dollars to send these goods to Europe. But more significant was this. The man on the left is John J. McCloy of the Council on Foreign Relations. He was in charge of Marshall Plan funds in Europe. And the man on the right is Jean Monnet, the founder of the common market. Time magazine called him the father of Europe. In 1947, Monnet sent his people to McCloy 
and said they needed money to start a European Union movement. McCloy turned over unlimited Marshall Plan funds, what were called counterpart funds, to Monet's people to start the European Union movement. Those funds were used to host the first Council of Europe meeting in 1949, to found universities would advocate uh, European Union, to fund the European Union youth movement, and to fund the political campaigns of politicians who would advocate a European Union. European Union didn't just happen recently, it started back in those days, and Americans never knew their tax dollars were being used for this purpose. By the way, John J. McCloy, a true insider's insider, when he returned to the United States, he became chairman of the Chase Manhattan Bank, chairman of the Council on Foreign Relations. He was also one of the first presidents of the World Bank. Now you've heard of the World Bank, an international monetary fund. Uh, how did they get started? Your history books say they were started at the Bretton Woods Conference. Well, that's true. Officially, they were started at the Bretton Woods Conference, but all the groundwork was first laid by the Council on Foreign Relations at what they called their Economic and Finance Group. In other words, the Council on Foreign Relations is a factory of American foreign policy, but how many people even know it exists? By the way, what was the purpose behind the World Bank and the IMF? We're told these are essentially charitable organizations attached to the UN that help out poor countries with their debt problems. Well, actually, it's a loan guarantee scheme. Here's what happened. After World War II, the banks down in New York, like National City and Chase, wanted to continue loaning money to the governments of nations. But they said to themselves, you know, after the war, some of these countries are kind of on shaky financial ground. What if one of them missed an interest payment? Wouldn't that be tragic for us? We've got to find a sucker, a dope, stupid enough to pick up the tab for us. So every time we miss an interest payment, they'll pay it. Well, who is the sucker? American. Us, American taxpayer, that's right. Here's how it works. Chase would loan money to, say, Poland. Poland's going along making payments, and Poland says, look, we just can't make this month's payment. What happens? World Bank or IMF comes in with our tax dollars, gives it to Poland. Poland gives it to the bankers. Bankers never miss a payment. Now, if you think I'm making this up, I'm going to quote Jesse Helms, you know, Senator Helms, former chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, said this, the New York banks have found important profit centers in lending to countries plunged into debt. This has been an essentially riskless game for the banks because the IMF and World Bank have stood ready to bail the banks out with our taxpayers' money. Huh. A.K. Chesterton, the noted British political observer, said this, the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund were not incubated by hard-pressed governments, but by a supranational money power which could afford to look ahead to the shaping of a post-war world that would serve its interest. By the way, it's not just about profit. You look at the Marshall Plan and all these other plans and the Fed, it's never just about profit. They're trying to move money into that machine, into that establishment structure. But there's always a political purpose as well. And in the case of the World Bank and the IMF, they don't just give out this money for nothing. They demand a say in government. They may say to an African country, sure, we'll give you uh, money to help you out with your debt problems, but we want you to uh, change your leadership. We want you to uh, change your, uh, put your national resources under uh, the control of uh, of important uh, American multinational corporation. A few years ago, Boris Yeltsin was in trouble in Russia, elect election trouble, and the establishment liked Boris Yeltsin, so the <laughs> World Bank came through with a five billion dollar loan for Russia. It's amazing what five billion dollars will do for your popularity, and Yeltsin got reelected. So there's a political purpose behind these banks as well as a profit motive. Now, I'm going to bring it up to present time uh, to close us tonight, but before I do, I want to s touch on the Vietnam War because I don't think anything did more to change the cultural landscape of America in the 20th century more than the Vietnam War. Now, if you ask the establishment, you consult their resources, they'll say it was all a quagmire. I did a word search once on Yahoo, and if uh, I use the terms quagmire in Vietnam, I found there were more than one million websites that matched those two words. What they say is it's just a quagmire, which means a bog or a swamp. They say, well, all the fault of the, the, the West Point guys. You know, the military gave our civilian government a lot of bad advice, and they thought it would be a piece of cake to be the communist in Vietnam. And, but they underestimated the love of the Vietnamese people for the communist leader Ho Chi Minh. So we sent 100,000 troops. That didn't work. 200,000, 500,000 troops didn't work. The war was unwinnable, but those patriotic right-wing hawks were too patriotic to pull out. So the war dragged on for 14 years until finally we left in ignoble defeat. And that's it. It's just a big quagmire, a big mess. Well, that's how they explain it. Now let's look at what really happened. The first key to understanding Vietnam, I think, is to give it some context. Now, World War II, we fought a two-front war in Europe and Asia. Let's give credit. 
We're not up against any wimps. The Germans and the Japanese had tough armies, tough air forces, and tough navies, yet we defeated those two empires in three and a half years with the help of our allies. But in Vietnam, we fought a tiny country for 14 years and couldn't win. Why was that? Well, in 1968, a group of retired military officers published an article in which they pointed out that the Vietnam War could be won in a few months. How to do it? Well, they, first of all, they pointed out that uh, 90% of North Vietnam's supplies were coming through the port of Haiphong. They said, why aren't we blockading this port if we're serious about winning the war? Now, the supplies were coming down the Ho Chi Minh Trail to the south, and President Johnson was periodically bombing the trail, but the uh, Vietnamese just pulled off the trail and waited till the bombs had been dropped and went back on. These officers pointed out that the trail needed to be blocked with troops. Furthermore, the American Secretary of Defense, Robert McNamara, a member of the Council on Foreign Relations, was only allowing the Air Force to bomb 6% of the strategic targets it wanted to hit. 94% were denied by him. By the way, when he left the Defense Department, became president of the World Bank. Nice club these guys are in. But the worst thing was probably the rules of engagement, which were not declassified until 1985 when they took up 26 pages of fine print in the congressional record. According to the rules of engagement, you could not bomb an enemy fighter plane on the ground. You had to wait until it was up in the air and showing hostile intent. You couldn't shoot at the enemy first. You had to let him shoot at you first. You couldn't bomb a missile to air surface launch site. You had to wait until it was fully operational. Now, suppose we'd fought like that in World War II. Let's go back for a moment to the jaunty days of the Royal Air Force. Let's say the RAF is flying over Germany. And one of the pilots says, a wing commander, there appear to be about 50 Messerschmitt fighters on the airfield below us, sir. Shall we commit a strike, sir? And the wing commander says, I know, chaps. Wouldn't be cricket, you know. Got to give those Jerry's a fair warning first. <laughs> Let them get up in the air first, I say. Let them take the first shot at us, I say. You know, Mr. Churchill's given us the strictest orders. We're to fight this war in a more sporting manner. We're to let these German chaps know they're dealing with real gentlemen from Oxford and Cambridge. Come on, do we fight World War II like that? No. If we had fought World War II under the same regulations we fought in Vietnam, we would have lost World War II. So, question is, who was responsible for this mess? Establishment wants you to think it's the West Point guys. Not true. When did President Kennedy first commit to sending combat troops to Vietnam? It was October of 1961, and the advice of this man, Walt Rostow, an older picture of him. Rostow of the State Department and Council on Foreign Relations had just returned from Vietnam on a fact-finding mission. It was on his advice that Kennedy sent those 10,000 troops. So you might think, well, Jim, obviously this guy, Rostow, was a great anti-communist, or he never would have given Kennedy that advice. To the contrary, two of his aunts were members of the U.S. Communist Party. His father had been a Marxist revolutionary in Russia. His brother, Eugene Debs Rostow, was named for the Socialist Party worker, leader, Eugene Debs. During the Eisenhower administration in the 50s, uh, he tried three times to get into the State Department. Each time was rejected as a security risk. The only way the Kennedy administration was able to get Rostow into the State Department was by firing the head of security for the State Department, Otto Otepka. An entire book has been written on that subject, The Ordeal of Otto Otepka, by a friend of mine, the late, great William J. Gill. But you might think, well, okay, Jim, he wasn't such a big anti-communist, maybe, but I bet he was a great nationalist patriot. To the contrary, here's what he wrote one year before giving Kennedy this advice. It is a legitimate American national objective to see removed from all nations, including the United States, the right to use substantial military force to pursue their own interests. Since this right is the root of national sovereignty, it is therefore an American interest to see an end to nationhood, as it has been historically defined. An end to nationhood. That's a classic Council on Foreign Relations prescription for American policy. Now, remember before we said the Tonga Gulf Resolution was written before the Tonga Gulf incident? Who wrote it? It was the Assistant Secretary of State for Far Eastern Affairs, William P. Bundy, member of the Council on Foreign Relations. So you might think, well, this Bundy guy must have been a great anti-communist if he wrote the Tonga Gulf Resolution. Hey, you know what Bundy was doing back in the 50s? He said of the Alger His Defense Fund, the notorious Soviet spy. I know that Hiss denied the charges, but now the uh, recently released uh, FBI's Venona tapes have shown beyond a shadow of a doubt that he was in fact a Soviet agent. Those self-respecting anti-communists would become have a defense fund for a communist spy. 
So you might think, well, uh, maybe he wasn't such an anti-communist, but I bet he was a patriot. I bet he went skipping down the street singing Yankee Doodle Dandy. <laughs> Not quite. When he left the State Department, David Rockefeller appointed him editor of Foreign Affairs, this nation's number one journal, calling for an end to American sovereignty. One more thing about Vietnam, though. What caused President Johnson to escalate the war? Why did he suddenly start sending hundreds of thousands of troops in 1965? The reason is, he had a secret meeting with a secret clique of advisors called the Wise Men, 14 senior policy advisors, 12 of whom were members of the Council on Foreign Relations. And Mr. Perloff, I think we just heard some more conspiracy gobbledygook. I don't believe there was any such meeting. If you don't believe it, you need to read the book, The Wise Men, by Isaacson and Thomas, members of the CFR. And this book is, by the way, not condemning them. It's glorifying them. Who was the leader of the Wise Men? It was Dean Acheson. It was Acheson who was most vocal in insisting to Johnson that he must escalate the war in Vietnam. So you'll think, well, Jim, obviously then, he must have been motivated by anti-communism. To the contrary. You know what he was doing back in the 1920s? Joseph Stalin, this is before we even recognized the, the Bolshevik regime, Joseph Stalin picked a young New York attorney to represent Bolshevik interests in, in America. He picked Dean Acheson. Now some people would say, well, Jim, I'm sure there's an easy explanation for that. You know, Probably Stalin didn't know who to get for an attorney, so he just flipped over the Manhattan Yellow Pages, and he closed his eyes, and he put his finger down, and it just happened to come down on Dean Acheson's name. After World War II, the communist regime, the new communist regime in Poland was having trouble getting U.S. recognition. Whose law firm did they recruit to get U.S. recognition? The law firm that every communist knew he could trust, the law firm of Dean Acheson. Acheson's law partner was Donald Hiss, the brother of the Soviet spy. When Acheson was in the State Department, he surrounded himself with 14 members of the U.S. Communist Party. That's not imagination. That is a fact. John Stuart Service, John Carter Vincent, Lachlan Curry. When John Stuart Service was caught passing secrets to the Soviet Union by the FBI, Acheson didn't fire him. He promoted him. This man was no anti-communist. And by the way, want to know who his son-in-law was? ba -bum. See, it's a very small clique of men who actually got us into Vietnam. And when you realize that the CFR clique that got us into Vietnam wrote the rules of engagement that made it impossible to win in Vietnam, you realize that what happened in Vietnam was not a quagmire or an accident. Well, what's the establishment agenda today? They're still promising us peace and prosperity. How are we going to get that? Well. The prosperity, they say, will come through multinational trade agreements, and the peace will come through their war on terror. Now, let's do, uh, do these individually. Now, as far as the trade goes, I'm sure uh, most of you are familiar with these acronyms, North American Free Trade Agreement, General Agreement on Trade and Tariffs, World Trade Organization, Free Trade Area of the Americas, which is a plan to expand NAFTA to the entire Western Hemisphere, and Security and Prosperity Partnership, which is a plan for a North American Union. Euro, uh, in the style of the European Union. Now you probably noticed something else, which is that jobs are disappearing in America. Our steel industry wiped out. Textile industry wiped out. Electronics industry wiped out. Where are all the jobs going? Not, not hard to figure out. They're going overseas, right? Why is that? I'll make it very simple. It used to be that a woman would go to Walmart, see two items, one made in America, one made in China. The one made in America would cost $5. The one from China, which had a tariff on it, would cost Four fifty, And she'd say, well, the one uh, from China is a little cheaper, but the one in America is a lot nicer made. I'm going to buy the one made in America. But then we got into NAFTA, we got into the World Trade Organization, and what these did was to destroy, eradicate our tariff structure, meaning that now the same Chinese item comes in without a tariff on it, and now it costs only $1.50. But the American item still costs $5. What these trade agreements did was to flood us with cheap slave labor imports. The woman now goes to Walmart. She says, well, I like the one made in America, but I can't resist a bargain. I'm going to have to buy that one made in China. What happens? The American manufacturer now goes out of business. We have to uh, move his shop over to China. That has happened across every sector of industry here in America. Now, I taped the original hearings on the, the GATT Treaty in 1994. And at that time, senators swore up and down, you know, we're not going to increase the trade deficit as a result of this treaty. We're just going to export and import. It's going to flow both ways. Well, we passed the bill. We ratified the treaty. The very next year, 1995, our trade deficit reached a new all-time high of $103 billion, and last year, $711 billion. The biggest item we're exporting these days is our jobs. 
Mm. Now, how many votes does America have in the World Trade Organization? Well, uh, when the GATT Treaty was passed, Europe got 30 votes, Africa got 35, and America got one vote. Our voting power is the same as the Maldives population, 200,000. What that means is these other countries can make the rules, keep our goods out of their countries while forcing us to accept theirs. But who pays for the World Trade Organization? That's right. American taxpayers pay the lion's share. They thought that was only fair. Well, America's founding fathers, you know what they would have called that? Taxation without representation. Who created the World Trade Organization? Now, do you think it was average Joes like you and me? Hey, Bob, you know, I think we ought to have our, our union with the Canadians and the Mexicans. Ralph, that's a swell idea. Let's tell our congressman about that. Do you think that's how our foreign policy originates? Do you think that we originated it? No, it's forced on us from above. Again, I taped the original hearings, and uh, at the time of the GATT Treaty hearings in Congress, uh, a member of the Council on Foreign Relations, Wall Street banker named Felix Ray Rohayton came down to testify on behalf of the treaty. He said that if America failed to ratify the treaty, he said the markets might react adversely. And I remember uh, Senator James Exxon of Nebraska was there, and he said, well, now, Mr. Rohayton, uh, we hear these dire economic predictions from you economists all the time. Nothing ever comes of them. Nothing ever comes of them, huh? That very same day, Alan Greenspan raised short-term interest rates 0.75%, a whopping increase which no one was expecting. As a result, the stock market started to plunge, and it tumbled for four straight days until finally, with everybody getting nervous, Bob Dole raced over to the White House, stood shoulder to shoulder with President Clinton, and said that the Congress would provide bipartisan support for the GATT Treaty, and it was passed, and the very next day, the stock market went back up. Senator Ernest Hollings, who chaired those hearings on the GATT Treaty, was very outspoken. Here's what he said on the floor of the Senate. They, referring to multinational corporations and banks, have got the Council on Foreign Relations up there in New York. If you ever run for president, they'll invite you. You can get out, you can get their contributions, you can get their support. I've been there, I know what I'm talking about. But that is what our friend David Rockefeller and all that got that steam together. It's not about jobs, it's about money. Well, they're getting rich and we're losing jobs. They're debilitating and destroying us. Well, I would take it even a step further than what Senator Hollings said. It's about more than money. It's about restructuring North America. What is the purpose of these international trade accords? Henry Kissinger, believe it, he's one of the big shots of the Council of Foreign Relations, said NAFTA will represent the most creative step towards a new world order taken by any group of countries since the end of the Cold War. And David Rockefeller, speaking of NAFTA, said, everything is in place after 500 years to build a true new world in the Western Hemisphere. Now this next man, Andrew Redding, you've probably haven't heard of, but I, the way he says this does much to elucidate what their plan is. NAFTA will signal the formation, however tentatively, of a new political unit, North America. With economic integration will come political integration. By whatever name, this is an incipient form of international government. Following the lead of the Europeans, North America should begin considering formation of a continental parliament. See what he's saying there, how economic, Consolidation will lead to political. Same thing happened in Europe. They started out with a common market, right? And they told Europeans, all we want to do is create prosperity. We just want to knock down the tariffs and have free trade. But guess what? Then they said, look, uh, with all this trade going on, we need some common laws to regulate it. So they came up with the European Parliament. Now they've got the European Union. Now you've got your Euro. Now your sovereignty is going down the drain. Same thing is planned for America. Now how about the war on terror? We're all against terrorism. But many of us are concerned that the war on terror has given our government unprecedented powers to spy on its own citizens. And where did the Department of Homeland Security come? A lot of people think it was invented after 911. It actually came before 911. It was recommended by the U.S. Commission on National Security, a 12-person task force, nine of whose members were members of the Council on Foreign Relations. And what they recommended was what they called a National Homeland Security Agency, the exact words used by President Bush after 911. <laughs> one uh, question we really have is who's going to be ultimately defined as a terrorist? Now, one answer to that comes from Anna Quindlin. She's a columnist for Newsweek. After 911, she uh, published a, uh, a column called The Terrorist Here at Home. And who do you think she was talking about when she said the terrorist here at home? Pro life movement. Here's what she wrote. She said, there's no real ideological difference between these people, the pro-life movement, and the people who flew planes into the World Trade Center. One of the leaders of Operation Rescue once sent his followers a letter that concluded, return to the training so that God may use you. Sound familiar? What's Quinlan saying here? That 
the pro-life people should be classified as terrorists. Now, if that happened in the Homeland Security, they could lose their websites, have their assets frozen, be prosecuted without due process, right? Now, there's a connection between the trade agreements and the war on terror. Yes, they're both being used to advocate consolidating the North American countries into one union. Robert Pastor of the Council on Foreign Relations wrote this in Foreign Affairs about security. He said, security fears serve as a catalyst for deeper integration. That will require new structures to assure mutual security. The Department of Homeland Security should expand its mission to include continental security, a shift best achieved by incorporating Mexican and Canadian perspectives and personnel into its design and operation. And so it's coming now, the Security and Prosperity Partnership of North America. Most people don't know it, but President Bush has already signed the agreement with President Fox of Mexico and Prime Minister Martin of Canada to begin the process of unionizing, creating a union with Canada and Mexico. And this was missed completely by the mass media, except for Lou Dobbs of CNN, who said this about the new agreement. He said, President Bush signed a formal agreement that will end the United States as we know it. And he took the step without approval from either the US Congress or the people of the United States. We are not writing our own foreign policy. Now, by the way, are these regional blocs like the European Union and Security and Prosperity Partnership, are the ends in themselves? No, they're just stepping stones towards world government, which is world tyranny. Joseph Stalin, the dictator of the Soviet Union, understood this principle. Here's what he wrote. Populations will more readily abandon their national loyalties to a vague regional loyalty than they will for a world authority. Later, the regionals can be brought all the way into a single world dictatorship. And to hear it from the Council on Foreign Relations, the big new Brzezinski said this, we cannot leap into world government in one quick step. The precondition for genuine globalization is progressive regionalization. And that pretty much uh, completes my talk, except I want to touch on one more thing. I'm going to become my own critic again. I'm Mr. Perloff. I've been listening to you talk here uh, all night. And some of the things you say are a little bit interesting. But you know what, Mr. Perloff? There's an easy litmus test by which we disprove everything you've said tonight. See, Mr. Perloff, our founding fathers gave us freedom of the press. Freedom of speech, freedom of the press. So you can be sure there are no big secrets in America. Now here in America, we have a lot of choices. Uh, you, know, you live up there in Boston, Mr. Perloff, you can read the Boston Globe, but if you don't like it, read the Times or the Post or any other of many major daily newspapers. If you don't like your news in a daily format, Mr. Perloff, you can get it in a weekly format from one of these fine news resources. Or if you don't like to read Mr. Perloff, and I suspect you don't, you can get it from television news. Now, Mr. Perloff, this is a small sampling of our media marketplace. It's a marketplace of ideas. Now, are you seriously trying to suggest that all the reporters for all these media outlets missed all these stories when missing about <laughs> I, I don't think so, Mr. Perloff. You know what? I think you have no credibility. Why should we believe a goofball like you? Well, we can turn to a respected source of news and information like the New York Times. Hmm? I tell you what, Mr. Perloff, I'll believe the stuff you've been saying the day the New York Times prints it. Until then, don't waste your breath on me, huh? All right, what about that? Well, you better believe that an establishment that's powerful enough to control our government and our banks is also powerful enough to run the media. And you better be sure they're also smart enough to have figured out a long time ago that if they want their agenda passed, they're going to have to control the media that shapes public opinion. Just to take the New York Times as an example, because this is not a talk on the media tonight. Uh, in the 19th century, the Rothschild sent their agent, uh, August Belmont, who's in the upper left there. That was not his real name. They thought August Belmont would sound pretty classy. And uh, he and J.P. Morgan offered money to Alfred Ox if he would buy a, a newspaper that would represent establishment interest in America. And Ox took that money, and he bought a small newspaper called the New York Times, which at that time had a circulation of just 9,000. But with the power of Rothschild and Morgan behind him, Ox turned the New York Times into the world's most powerful newspaper. He immediately moved it to new headquarters, plush new headquarters, what is now called Times Square. He was able to buy famous writers, bring them into the fold, buy up channels of distribution. But I just want to point out, the New York Times was not built on integrity, it was built on money. And from Ox, the ownership passed on to Sulzberger, Dreyfus, and Sulzberger, all members of the Council on Foreign Relations. And if you look at the Times editorial history, you'll find they've consistently supported the policies advocated by the CFR. For example, when Paul Warburg was up for uh, vice chairman of the Fed and uh, congressmen were making noises about this guy, the New York Times published an editorial saying what a great patriot he was. The guy next to Fidel Castro there is New York Times reporter Herbert L. Matthews. It was his articles in the New York Times that persuaded Americans 
that Castro was not a communist, but was actually the George Washington of Cuba. Matthews, member of the Council on Foreign Relations. The man on the lower left, Leslie Gelb, New York Times editor, one of the key figures behind the Pentagon Papers, which demoralized America so much during the Vietnam War. So you might think, well, maybe Gelb will expose the CFR. Not likely. He was its president for 10 years, still its president emeritus. When you talk about the New York Times and the Council of Foreign Relations, you're talking about two faces of the same institution. They are not going to expose each other. What looks at first like great diversity actually is not. Our Boston Globe up in Boston is owned by the New York Times, just as the Washington Post owns, uh, uh, Post Company owns Newsweek, just as Disney owns ABC News, just as CBS owns the big publisher Simon & Schuster. Um, or take a look at one corporation, AOL Time Warner, owns America Online, Time Magazine, Warner Brothers, CNN, Turner Broadcasting, HBO, Sports Illustrated, 130 magazines not even listed here. If you take all the movie chains and uh, major radio networks, TV networks, major magazines, newspapers, and publishing houses, most of them are owned by about a dozen corporate entities which interlock at the top with membership in the Council on Foreign Relations. My final quote confirming this comes from David Rockefeller himself, who said this at a dinner in 1991. We are grateful to the Washington Post, the New York Times, Time Magazine, and other great publications and directors have attended our meetings and respected their promises of discretion. For almost 40 years, it would have been impossible for us to develop our plan for the world if we'd been subject to the bright lights of publicity during these years. But the world is now more sophisticated and prepared to march towards a world government who shall never again know war but only what? Well, that does conclude my presentation. I uh, do want to encourage you, if you're not always subscribing to the New American, if you're uh, depending on uh, the Times and Time Magazine to step outside the box, see what else is out there. It's already been mentioned in my book, Shadows of Power. We do have uh, a few copies in stock tonight. These guys already mentioned very kindly my books, Tornado in a Junkyard. In the case of Star, when I do give PowerPoints, if any of you are interested ever, having to speak at your church or organization on that subject, the evidence for the world being designed, we're not here by chance. Thank you.